Thank you, Mary. Thank you, thank you Alexandri, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, everyone tells you there are lots of problems and difficulties, and they're short on solutions. So my job today is I've come straight from the big commissioners meeting in England, where we're negotiating for, for the drugs and for the funding. So I'm going to try and give you some solutions and tell you that you need to embrace this problem. That's my disclosures. Now, look, we're here because of this. We believe that drugs have a really big part to play in cancer medicine. Our society's name tells you everything you need to know. And we're here from lots of countries, and I value that. I value all my work with international colleagues because we deal with a globally important disease. Cancer is the ultimate cooperative illness. It's been the world's biggest killer since 2010. It has the biggest economic impact of any cause of death in the world, the highest cause of economic loss as those people live. It's 17% of the healthy life years lost in Europe, 170 million years of life lost globally each year, and it costs us more than two and a half trillion dollars a year in loss to which 5% of the global drug bill is a small balance. There's a cost to cancer, and there's a cost to cancer care. But we see it as a negative thing, a problem. But it isn't. It's an investment. It's an investment, and we're fighting the mole's most important disease. That's surely worth something. And we're getting payback from that investment. We add one paper on fundamental knowledge every minute to PubMed. Everywhere you look, nearabouts, we're improving the situation. Very few countries are getting worse. The UK, 20% better in 20 years. When people think we're losing the war on cancer, look at this. When I was at school, the median survival of cancer in Britain was one year, now it's ten. Tenfold better. We're winning the war, and now is not the time to give up. There's good news. We think that more than half the survival benefit from cancer in recent decades has come from our treatment medicines. It's not to deny the benefit of exercise and dietary change and smoking cessation. It's just we're as big a player as all of those put together. And that's why we're here. The innovation and exploration of our universities and research centers is being translated to treatments never faster than now. If we look at the armory we had, our essential medicines, they've come from a very small base and slowly grown over time. But something remarkable has happened recently. If this rate of change continues, we are going to add more than 100 new medicines by 2020. And that's crucial for our ability to control advanced cancer. At any one time, almost 2,000 medicines are in the pipeline for us. And they are transforming care. Let's just give you examples of transferring from the old chemotherapy to the new targeted precision era of diseases where, with advanced cancer, we more than triple survival. And these are essential medicines. And this millennium started with a real possibility for us as oncologists. Our understanding of the complexity of cancer, it's 200 diseases, four stage groups for each one, is that all that complexity can be explained by the deregulation of just a few pathways. And therefore, all that diversity might be treated by a limited panel of drugs targeted by high-precision pathology. Where were we at the millennium? Well, it looks like this, didn't it? Tell me, doctor, what have I got? Or oh, I'm sorry to say you've got breast cancer. It's an anatomic diagnosis. Where are we now, just a short time later? Well, we tell them about the pathway. I'm sorry you've got ER overexpressing breast cancer, her overexpressing breast cancer. We know breast cancer now has at least 10 separate diseases, each with a different cause, a life expectancy, and a treatment program. Where are we heading? Well, already we've got the first-generation cancer genome atlas. 
From your pathology, you can find the pathways deregulated, the drug class required to counter it, and put it into action. And put into action, you can put surgeons out of business. You can make breast cancers disappear in 11 days. We're going to stop anatomic diagnosis. We'll treat you because of your molecular signature. So you'll be put in a basket by your molecular pathology, not by your anatomy. And we now have entered the era of basket trials. Doctor, how should we treat it? Well, in your situation with three key steps deregulated, we might need three concurrent therapies. Bringing in perhaps immune checkpoint targeting, our latest armory. And this is something we knew from the chemotherapy era, that it is very likely that the low response seen to monotherapy is because of cross-signaling. We knew that from the Hanneman-Weinberg paper. So we're going to have to expect to give these drugs in parallel. Will my health insurance cover that? Ah, the average cost per month of a new branded oncology drug is around $10,000. Let's do the sums about a third of a million dollars each year. And that's why I'm on stage. We have a problem. There's a widespread belief that we cannot afford to win the war on cancer. So look, I've got to send you back against the payers as economists. So you're all clever, give me two minutes and I hope you had some coffee. Economics for the uninitiated. Economics is not primarily about saving money. It's about using our scarce resource as effectively as possible. Economists never say cheap or expensive. Things are cost-effective or not cost-effective. They're good value or they're not good value. And you know more economics than you think. If you've bought a car, bought a house recently, you will have traded off price and value. Now, we get scared of economics because of language. Economics is Greek. It's a Greek word. In fact, it's two Greek words, oikos and nomos, wise rules and household. Economics is the wise rules for managing a household. If you spend your budget on a big holiday in the early part of the year, you won't go on holiday later in the year. So if wise rules for managing the household is economics, health economics is wise rules for managing hospitals, clinics, health systems, that's what you and I do every day of our working lives. At medical school and pharmacy school, we taught you the ease of pharmacology. Can it work? Efficacy. Does it work in reality? Effectiveness. And all I want you to do now is to add one more E. Economists call it efficiency, cost effectiveness. And let's make it very clear what we mean. Is it worth doing compared with other things we could do with the same money if you're a payer or for a patient with my remaining time? Last thing you have to learn is called opportunity cost. A euro can only be spent once. Once you've spent it, you lose the opportunity to spend it on something else, perhaps something better. Okay, so now you're economists, let's put the economist slide rule onto the problem. We have to focus our scarce resource to where it'll help people live longer and live better. Estimates suggest that in many of our countries we waste billions of dollars of investment each year because we direct care to more care, not better care. Let's show you the power of economic thinking in medicine. Let's go to America and sort out their problems. Assuming we worry about health, and we believe that taxpayers should fund some aspects. Could we do better? Well, America invests in almost 200 publicly funded health programs. It costs around $21 billion a year, and it saves around 600 life years each year. If we could reallocate those funds to the most cost-effective treatments, we will double the benefit with another 638,000 life years saved for no more money. Now, America's the extreme, but we could do that in almost every country of the world. The payers predict that our treatment model is unaffordable. Because it's true, without a focus on value, our overall costs will rise. So the problem with compound growth interest is here. 
2020 isn't far away, and if we don't change our strategy, we have to advocate in the United States for 66% more money, the United Kingdom 55, Australia 42. All the problems you know in financing your departments. And there is no new money to fund that wave. Since 2008, the debt crisis, there's been a massive gap between what we've earned and what we've spent. There simply is no more money to fund the breakthrough we believe we're just on the edge of. Now, the first problem is having more patients to treat. The world is getting older. And cancer is primarily a disease of aging. So with the European School of Oncology panel on access to innovation in cancer treatment, which Matty Apro and IK steered, we looked at this as one of our fundamentals. We can do nothing about aging, it's a success. But do you know, in Europe, we can afford aging. That is not our problem. We have to turn our focus on this, the rising cost of each new generation of cancer treatment. And the rise is dramatic. Cancer drugs have been rising five times faster than any other class of medicine. And that's why the economic view is always focused on cancer medicine, cancer medicine, cancer medicine. No one likes a curve in maths, so let's you use log cost against time. And we heard the origin was about 10 years ago, but it's not. You know, the origin is back in the 1970s. We have never got a handle on cost control in oncology research for 45 years. Now, straight lines, we can make predictions. And it's been a straight line through all the recessions and ups and downs of the economy. Let's go forward, and I'll tell you when will it cost 10, 100,000 US dollars a month for novel treatment, and the answer is 2035. Now, that's clearly impossible. So somewhere between now and 2035, we as medical societies have to take a lead on value. And it may as well be now as 2035. All the advances in biology and technology have failed to bend the rising cost curve of medical treatment. Does it always have to get more expensive? No, it doesn't. We know Moore's law, the rising power of computing and the falling cost. Why has drug development gone in reverse? If you look at the number of innovative drugs that we buy for an investment of a billion dollars in research, it looks like this. It's the opposite. It's costing around two, two and a half billion dollars to bring a new drug through to market. And that's why we don't call it Moore's Law. It's backwards in drug development. We call it e -Rooms Law. Moore's Law backwards. Do we despair? Well, I'm telling you this is work in progress. The breakthrough that we need to look at is this, the dramatic fall in cost of sequencing the human genome. The first genome cost more than $20 billion to sequence. It's now less than $600. It takes a couple of weeks, and that is falling. So we're now at a crossroads, as the Lancet Commission said. We're at a crossroads for affordable care, where our choices or our refusal to make them will affect the lives of millions. And that's why ESMO was the first to stand up and make statements about clinical value in our guidelines. We're going to have to move to make economic value statements too. So we have to understand the payers' perspective in this. They want us to change our way of making decisions. Prior to evidence-based medicine, we focused on activity, response. Evidence-based medicine means we focus on the efficacy, overall survival benefits, quality of life. And the question that we know to ask for that is this. Does this intervention make you live longer or live better or hopefully both? And we now have to transition to something called VBM, or value-based medicine. And this focuses on the effectiveness and value to the stakeholders, to the patient, time without symptoms, time alive, to the payer, it's money. And the question we ask, remember, you're economists now, is this worth doing compared with other things we could do with the same resource? Can payers trust us to lead on the value agenda? There's a conflict. We want to give the best health to each patient, 
payers want to buy the most health from their resource, their insurance pool, their taxpayers' money. And that sets up a conflict. We've got half the way there in resolving it. When payers look at the ESMO metrics for our guidelines, they have some approving things to say. Here are our principles. Cure takes precedence over deferral of death. Yep, we like that. Direct endpoints over surrogate endpoints. Very good. Disease-free survival for cure is much more important than in advanced incurable disease. Very good. But we fall at the final hurdle. Cost is not taken into account. Let's go across the Atlantic to our colleagues who proudly said they were putting costs into their guidelines. This is the NCCN guidelines, and you'll now know that there are costs in those little grids appearing. Now, the trouble with cost is, I told you, economists never say expensive or cheap. Things are cost-effective or they're not. Cost, without considering outcomes, does not tell you anything about the value of that treatment. A cheap treatment that does no good is worthless, but an expensive treatment that buys you years of life may be very, very good value and worth selling your car or even your house to get. So we need to merge the two into one that really reflects value. Can we be trusted to put this into action without external help? Have we in the past advocated for more care rather than better care? So it's a good time to look at the success of the Choose Wisely campaign. The seven key things that we did that were overused, that we thought were futile, didn't contribute to people living longer or better. Let's take a, a litmus test of how that's been going, and we failed. Two of the seven ineffective interventions have had a marginal decrease, but five of seven have gone on increasing. So we're given some options for what we do. We could carry on on our current path, putting off the day till 2035. And that's untenable even in the medium term. It might get us through one or two more years, but no further. We could carry on spending on our current rates and save from our budget to reinvest, get more and more efficient, improve our productivity. And that buys time to realign the whole funding of our research and healthcare systems. And that is viable in the medium term. So that should be our immediate priority. We, in the long term, need to align health spending with our national or global wealth. And that will take time. It's the only long-term option if we want to have oncology to hand on to the next and the next and the next generations. So what strategy should we put in our next generation guidelines? Well, we've got to understand why we see things differently. So let's tell you, when I become an economist, I have a different, uh, different view. But there are some fundamentals that are the same. Both economists and physicians are realists. We approach the problems of life. We rely on quantitative information, not just feelings. We have to make difficult choices in the face of uncertainty. And we know that good decisions require a balance of the benefits and the risks, the outcomes and the costs. Where we differ is in this. Physicians are concerned with one patient. You want to do the best for them. But economists tend to be thinking about big organizations' populations. And there is the conflict. Payers want the best for society, for their investment. And we want the best for one person. We're going to have to think from both sides now. Now, the first thing is we must not give up on innovation. The pathway model of cancer is the best we have. And I've seen no evidence to date that this is not a good route to follow. So when people are in trouble with money, do you cut investment in R&D? No, that's the one thing you step up. We heard, we heard from Alexandra how difficult it could be to decide the value of treatment. Okay, Remember, we can't decide the value of this yet because this is work in progress. It's work in progress. And there's lots more still to do. And the building blocks are coming quickly. This year at ASCO, you heard already, 
that personalized therapy directed by genomic tests is six times more effective than just simple marker, marker direction. The costs of repeatedly biopsying tumors and the trouble for patients was a stumbling block, but this year you'll see the UC Davis data. By sampling the blood, you get 98% concordance with resampling the tumor. That technology step is solved, and each step that we put up falls to the innovation of our researchers. But it's true. If you wait, you'll see the value change. Let's just look at the clinical value of trastuzumab over time with each new piece of data. And that problem for the payers was enormous. They couldn't decide what the effectiveness, the cost effectiveness of that drug was. And the result was that across Europe, intervention in terms of funding was delayed such that in the UK, a 7.5% durable survival benefit wasn't available for the majority of women in the first decade of that drug's use. It's also true for other drugs. Let's show you imatinib in the 13 wealthiest nations. Many people missed out because we didn't decide the value early. It'll be no different with targeted precision therapies. It's unfortunately just how it's going to be. So how quickly can we speed it up? Well, you'll know that Bill Gates has been putting money behind a new program, the England Genomics Program, which aims to sequence the next 70,000 uh, tumor genomes. That will produce a huge amount of data. Why are these biomarkers important, or genetic biomarkers? Well, you and I know that they mainly work to exclude patients from therapy. If we only had to pay for expensive targeted therapies when it worked, they would be cost effective. And that's the aim of this program. We've got to find money from within our current budgets. Innovation is expensive, and with no new money, we have to carve a hole out of our current budget to fund innovation. So where can we find that money? Well, the first thing is to realize that we've been treating people with marginal or no benefit. Just because the guideline says we can do a treatment doesn't mean it's right for every single one. The magnitude of effect falls in people, for example, who have high levels of comorbidity towards the end of life. So the benefits vary person by person, but the risks of our treatment generally are the same. There's a break-even point beyond which treatment becomes inappropriate and futile. And there's also an area where the benefits are so marginal that they don't become cost-effective or really worthwhile for a patient. Is it worth having six months of therapy to live just a few weeks longer? And we all know what these things are. They're chemotherapy at the end of life. They're the PSA tests that are given to people with life-limiting comorbidity. Doctors are very good at knowing this because they make these judgments for themselves. Studies across the world show that when doctors get cancer, they make different decisions to those that they advocate in guidelines for their patients. We shouldn't have trouble with that. We heard from Alexandria that we've made some claims for marginal therapies that really don't stand up. So if you look at the abstract keyword search over recent years for words like amazing, promising, unprecedented, innovative, Perhaps we have been hyping up our programs. So, should the ESMO minimum criteria not just exist for the drug and the protocol, but for the patient as well? Are there some groups of patients who we do not recommend to have treatment? Now we've got to save money. And the WHO gave us a whole handbook called More Health for the Money, and I won't take you through it step by step. Let's just look at number one of their 10 suggestions. They say, all of you can save money by buying equally effective, equally effective but cheaper medicines. That's their number one. And that really means generics and biosimilars. Last time we at the European School of Oncology covered this, we said, no name heroes can save Europe billions. And that was true because only four countries in Europe manage generics in two out of three cases where it would be possible. Now, I'm sure you're all better than that, but you'd think we'd have learned that lesson for biosimilars. But we haven't. 
biosimilar uptake between European nations varies between 1 and 100 percent. There's no logic behind that. It's not scientific. Biosimilar medicines, you know, are copies of biologic patent-expired medicines. They share the same international non-proprietary name. We've used them in Europe for a decade with no evidence they perform any differently. The cumulative savings, just for the big five EU nations in America, could exceed $50 billion over the next five years, perhaps as much as 100 billion euros. And so it's clear that our guidelines have to endorse that. And we're backed up by Margaret Chan. Rational prescribing, we're told, is not just the right drug, in the right dose, in the right schedule, but at the lowest cost to the patient and community. We have to be the endorsers of generics and biosimilars. Have we, in our haste to reach precision-targeted therapy, missed some paths we should have followed. Now, let's have a think. What would you recommend your partner have if you resected a high-risk colon cancer? Well, 5 fuflinic acid, very good. 12% absolute survival benefit, not very toxic unless you've got a genetic polymorphism. A lot of us would think that's good. We can get an extra 4 to 4.5% 4 absolute survival benefit by adding a third drug that would be good. That's what our guidelines say. Now, anyone like to recommend the other drug class that we're missing? That isn't the reference. That's had five randomized trials of Cochrane Review and has an overall survival hazard ratio of 0.53, as good as those two. Anyone want to tell me what that drug treatment is? It's cimetidine. It's cimetidine. It costs two to four dollars per month. There are five randomized trials of Cochrane meta-analysis. But it's an unlicensed therapy, and it's not in our guidelines. It's not in the ASCO guidelines, nor the Japanese guidelines. And that's a humbling thing. Why didn't we spot that? Now that you know that, and this is an over-the-counter drug you can buy, tell me, if you had bowel cancer, who here wouldn't go across the road and buy over-the-counter anti-ulcer medicine? at two to four dollars a month to reduce their hazard ratio of relapse and death by half. That's the knowledge that maybe has to go in our guidelines for our patients. Patients already take risks with drugs that we think are unacceptable because up to half our patients take unproven alternative therapies and they're often toxic. So we've got to give leadership on that as well. Should we advocate for unlicensed therapies? Well, we're waiting for the aspirin trials, but already you know from the big Norwegian population study that there's a 9.4% absolute survival benefit, driven predominantly by cancer survival, not something else. And that magnitude of benefit's been confirmed by the multiple randomized trials and aspirin done by the Medical Research Council in the UK. Who here with bowel cancer wouldn't take aspirin each day? We know the risks, they're very simple. They cost a dollar for 50 tablets, that's the financial toxicity, and otherwise we have an increased risk of bleeding in operations 125 to 1. It's pretty good odds, I'd take it, wouldn't you? And this is all part of the repurposing drugs program. There are cheap, effective drugs that we are not using because they are not licensed. So, should we become a drug developer? It's expensive to become a drug developer because you have to pay fees to the European Medicines Agency. About a third of a million euros to get a drug licensed and another 100,000 euros a year to keep it on label. But you know, something remarkable's happened. Last month, this document came out and we've been offered a 100% fee reduction if we become an academic drug developing partner of EMA. And there's something to vote on for our society. Let's not spare the radiotherapists. Would you want radiotherapy for head and neck cancer, which is very toxic, when it's convenient for you? Remember, 30 visits over six weeks, in the morning or the afternoon. I asked this of the leaders of Britain's 50 radiotherapy centres. Not one of them told me anything different than what was convenient for the hospital and patient. And that's the wrong answer, because the Canadian randomised trial showed quite clearly that having your radiotherapy for head and neck cancer in the morning dramatically reduced toxicity. 
and that toxicity difference could be seen more than six months later. Value isn't just in drug treatment, it's in all our programs. We know that IMRT, high-tech radiotherapy, can reduce side effects during head and neck cancer. But when you look at the cost effectiveness, that's a pretty weak intervention, and it's expensive. It costs three to five times more than conventional radiotherapy, which Alexandria is short of is in Romania. And yet, most radiotherapists, where they can bill, will bill for this expensive therapy, but not move patients to morning treatments. Now you know it, when would you want your radiotherapy? Of course, you want your head and neck radiotherapy in the morning because that's evidence-based medicine and it costs nothing. Now if it was a drug, we'd be advocating for it. We did trials of amifostine, which is toxic to see if we could get that benefit. But simply a pencil and a paper diary may be all you need to drive that innovation. Some things are really simple. If you can see a tree from the window in the hospital, you save the hospital money, you go home quicker. But you know, it's very hard to rebuild a hospital. So let's go to Japan and do a very simple randomized trial. Let's put pot plants in the room or not. Patients leave hospital quicker with lower rates of pain and less pain requirements. All our patients uh, with elderly, you know, elderly cancer patients tend to have comorbidity. Always ask them, when do you take your antihypertensive medication? Because we know if you take it in the evening, you get much better blood control and halve the rate of subsequently developing diabetes. This whole value and innovation program has left mainstream medicine behind, and we need to discover it again. As ESMO, our strength is that we're multinational. We cooperate or we fail. Thank you very much.